This video on demand presentation of Big Red Wrap Up is made possible by the following sponsors. Big Red Wrap Up thanks these sponsors. Coming up tonight on NET's Big Red Wrap Up. A winter storm couldn't stop Nebraska from welcoming in the 2015 recruiting class yesterday on National Signing Day. Tonight, we'll break down Mike Riley's first Husker recruiting class with Sean Callahan and Nate Klaus from Husker Online. I'm Kevin Kugler and welcome to NET's Big Red Wrap Up. It is over. The first ever recruiting class signed by Mike Riley. Put together obviously with a lot of help from the previous staff and a little bit of help at the end from the current staff. The two staffs joined hands, I guess, kind of, to finish off this staff and now and finish off this class. And now we've got the entire recruiting panel here to discuss it. Our usual cohorts. Blake Lawrence, Adrian Fiala, they've got the night off, but we're joined by the experts to help break down this signing class from Husker Online. Sean Callahan, of course, Nate Klaus is here as well. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure. Hey, it's been a, a long two months. I mean, Mike Riley, if you think about it, it's been two months since he's been hired. And uh, to get to this point, it's been, a, it's been a lot of work for those guys, and uh, it was good to get that first signing day out of the way for them. And, and I do think you have to give credit, and Mike Riley did this yesterday, to the previous staff for a lot of the legwork done on a good portion of this class. That's usually the case when one staff leaves and another staff moves in. That old staff had done some good work, and there's some good guys in this class as a result of that, Nate. Absolutely. You know, you're talking about half the class, 10 guys that were previously recruited recruited by Bo Pelini and 10 really key players too so um, you know you have to give a lot of credit to Bo Pelini and his staff uh, but Mike Riley also had to go in there and sell himself get these guys back in the boat which was which was very important yeah, and we'll talk about all of this tonight including some of the new tactics used by this Nebraska coaching staff and some of the new commits that came in very late right before National Signing Day we'll cover it all and as always you're a large part of our show we want to hear from you we've got a lot to get through tonight but we want to see your questions and comments on Facebook or Twitter. You can also email us this evening about Mike Riley's first Nebraska recruiting class. Your thoughts. We'd love to hear them all here on Big Red Wrap-Up. Now, this 2015 recruiting class, Sean, as Nate mentioned, kind of a half-and-half -half class. You've got a lot of guys from the old staff that had been put into the fold that Mike Riley and his staff had to go back out and reconvince to come to Nebraska. And then some new guys late. Let's start with the old guys because a lot of those guys ended up being the higher ranked guys in this class. Yeah, and I think, Kevin, it goes back to that first week in December when Mike Riley was hired. He had five days to figure things out, and it was probably the, the most key point in the recruiting process because he got in the living rooms of Avery Anderson, Eric Lee, Aaron Williams, and the Davis twins, and Stanley Morgan. And by doing that from a Monday to a Friday night, he essentially locked those guys up. And I think that's what kept this class together by keeping that core group of recruits intact. Uh, the Davis twins particularly and Avery Anderson and Eric Lee, all of them four-star type guys. Uh, I thought that's what solidified this uh, to being a good class because you don't see highly ranked recruiting classes very often uh, in a coaching change. It, it's tough. I mean, you go back to when Bo Pelini came, uh, recruits jump ship. Look at Michigan, the struggles they went through this year. Wisconsin had a lot of struggles. Uh, Florida rebounded on signing day, but they had some tr problems keeping guys so I think just the ability to keep that initial group in December uh, helped get this class uh, to where it was at, at number four in the Big Ten and, and Sean mentions the ranking in the Big Ten and he also mentioned the problems at Wisconsin and Michigan going through those coaching changes now I don't know that those are things that people expect to last long term certainly in Michigan's case Jim Harbaugh gets a lot of buzz up there but Nate how does this Nebraska class compare size-wise and quality-wise to the classes of a Michigan or Wisconsin that also went through these changes in the conference this year? Uh, pretty comparable size-wise to a class of, of Wisconsin's. Now, Michigan, they only ended up signing, you know, 13, 14 guys, uh, a little bit of a smaller class, so uh, that which affected their team ranking. Uh, but size-wise, pretty comparable uh, to all the other, you know, Power 5 schools that, that had coaching changes. There's the Big Ten recruiting rankings as per rivals in the conference. And, of course, Ohio State, Penn State with an excellent recruiting season under James Franklin. Michigan State building on their success. And as Mark D'Antonio said this week, we're not building on or we're not selling hope. We're selling results. And that's a great line because 
the results are obviously paying off for Michigan State as they get those recruits in. The results will continue. You see Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana both closed very strong. Does it surprise you to see those two teams right there in the middle? Yeah, Illinois uh, and Indiana, but particularly Indiana, um, it shows you know Kevin Wilson struggled there. They haven't done much. Uh, they haven't been close to a bowl game, but their offense, I think, intrigues players. They've had a lot of guys have success on offense, but uh, just based on location, you always think Illinois can recruit well. Um, it looks like they went, you know, they went to a bowl game this year, showed some progress, but that is kind of a surprise, uh, especially when you look at like Iowa. They had they had a poor finish. Um, you, you would like to see Iowa. Uh, recruit a little bit better uh, to kind of help the overall depth of the Big Ten. What's the biggest disappointment for Nebraska in this recruiting cycle, Nate? I mean, we saw a lot of the successes of Mike Riley, and you mentioned it in that first week, all of the successes that rolled in and really got people's confidence built up in the staff's ability to recruit. But what about a disappointment in your mind? Well, you know, you have to point to a guy like Reuben Jones, uh, who was a key defensive end that was committed to Pelini. Uh, you know, the, the new staff, for whatever reason, really weren't able to, to connect with him. And uh, he ended up, you know, flipping to Michigan, you know, once uh, Harbaugh came into the picture. So that's one guy that, that I think you could look at and, and see, you know, or say that, uh, you know, he was uh, impacted uh, the class negatively. Uh, you know, they lost Kendall Bussey, who was a highly rated running back. So did several uh, other schools. Several other schools. <laughs> <laughs> lost him as well um, but uh, you know by and large I, I think that uh, you know Mike Riley and his staff they, they did a very good job considering considering you know the circumstances I, I want to talk about the close because it's rare that we've seen right around signing day that flurry of activity at least around Nebraska football you see it a lot of other places but it doesn't happen a whole lot that you have in that final week and a lot of this is the nature of the compressed time that these coaches had to recruit but you had recruit after recruit after recruit in that final weekend committing and then even on the signing day recruits committing to Nebraska yeah they had four guys commit on that weekend and it was a terrible weather weekend and weekend uh, in Lincoln uh, snow wind I mean it was as you know when you're bringing guys in from Florida California uh, not ideal conditions um, there wasn't a basketball game to take them to um, so they really had a sell and and they did a great job I mean Nate and I we visited with all the recruits Sunday before they left town, and every one of them just raved about the snow. Um, they had a snowball fight with the coaches. They had never seen snow before. They said it actually wasn't as cold as they thought it would be with snow on the ground. So I think uh, just the sales pitch, the job they did to get those four guys on Sunday and then uh, close it out with Adrian Talon on signing day uh, was a nice finish here down the stretch. And we're going to go through all of the commits as we go through the show. We've got a lot of footage. We'll talk to some of the kids coming up a little bit later on. On here on Big Red Wrap-Up, but Nate, when you look at this, the, the tactics, I guess, used by this coaching staff, the applications of social media, the fax cam that got a lot of national discussion yesterday as people watched, you know, Teletubbies walk behind the fax cam and guys wearing funny masks and all this kind of stuff, and there are some older fans that look at this and go, this is, this is just goofy, this is silly, well, this is stupid, whatever you might think, but there are a lot of the younger fan base, and certainly the recruits that this is this appeals to them, doesn't it? Well, yeah, everyone's paying attention, you know, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, kids are especially are on social media. Uh, they're very active. The fan base is on social media all the time, uh, and they eat up anything, any insight that they can glean from from what's happening inside of the program. They absolutely eat it up. Uh, the, they become energized, and I think that this staff has really capitalized on capturing the fan base's energy and putting that back into the you know the recruiting trail. Now, this is a recruiting special, but that does not mean we don't have you covered with a new sideline survey tonight. I don't want you to think we're going to leave you hanging. What do you think of Mike Riley's first recruiting class at Nebraska? You think he did just what he needed to do? Could he and his staff have done better? Or are you just simply not impressed with this 20-person class? Right now, 77% of you say he did what he needed to do. 17% say, yeah, he could have been better. And 6% of you hate everything that's happening ever with anything that goes on in Lincoln. From street removal, from snow removal on the streets to Mike Riley's recruiting, you just don't like anything. Just go to our Facebook or wrap-up website, cast your vote in our very unscientific sideline survey. Now, outside of the world of recruiting, something the coaches could sell, I suppose, if they wanted to on the recruiting trail, a couple of Huskers this past week getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mick Tinglehoff, who waited and waited and waited for the chance to get into the Hall of Fame, finally gets the nod. And Will Shields, one of the greatest guards, maybe the greatest guard in the history of professional football, certainly in the conversation, 
he makes his way into the Hall of Fame. And, and Sean, I don't know if this is something that the coaches take out, but when it comes to the tradition of Nebraska football, this certainly had the help on the recruiting trail. Oh, no doubt. When you, you could say, hey, we just had two Hall of Fame offensive linemen come out of Nebraska. Let's let's get this thing going again. Let's redevelop it and get this offensive lineman, uh, offensive line back to where we're putting out uh, Hall, Hall of Famers like Will Shields. And coincidentally, they signed an offensive lineman, Jalen Barnett, from the high school of Will Shields in Lawton, Oklahoma. Well, we've had a chance to briefly talk about the 2015 recruiting class at Nebraska. Now let's hear what Coach Mike Riley had to say yesterday afternoon after the fax machines stopped. I've said this before. I was impressed with the work that. Uh, Bo's staff did with these kids and really impressed by the film that we saw and the people that we met in that next part of the process. How, do we, how were we able to retain that group uh, at that number? Uh, and, I, and I think that one thing for us, uh, frankly, we were, we were a little earlier hired than some of those schools. That Maybe one week is an advantage, right? Because I had that week to get right on some of those kids. And, uh, and I think that uh, I, 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 I'm going to give Nebraska credit again because I think those kids wanted to come to Nebraska. And uh, they, they just wanted to know if, if, if we were the right fit for them. Then we went off into that world of guys that we had been recruiting that were going to be the right fit here. And, and as we did that, we evaluated what our needs were in the depth chart, tried to fit that in in the meantime, and then we found some new players uh, in, uh, on the recruiting trail. Coach Riley with a terrible cold all day yesterday. I'm His assuming it's signing still there day today. cold. He His called signing it. day cold. He was sniffling, sneezing. He was drinking a lot of water, trying to keep his voice. Then he had to go to the recruiting dinner last night and. I can't imagine there were a lot of people who didn't want to shake his hand, but I hope they didn't shake his hand. He was actually doing fist pumps because he didn't want anyone to shake his hand to get sick. But you could just tell in his eyes, he was tired, he was beat down. And for all those guys, uh, you know, the, the work they put in in these last two months, particularly the last month to finish this class, it is literally 16, 18 hour days every day down the stretch to get this thing done. Nate, I know you've been on both sides of this, covering it and in the recruiting rooms trying to put a class together. How difficult was the task that Mike Riley and his staff had to undertake in the two months that they had? Well, you really can't put it into words because there are so many moving parts that, that you have to account for. And the logistics of just covering, you know, the entire country, flying, you know, to having 10 different coaches out on the road, uh, you know, crisscrossing across the country. Um, you know, you talk to some of the coaches and, and they'll tell you that, you know, when they were out on the road, sometimes they didn't even know what city they were waking up in. So, uh, you know, it was uh, extremely difficult uh, to, to identify your needs, to go out there, uh, sell a school that, you, that they were still learning about themselves, um, you know, it, but they were able to do it. And I think um, we saw, you know, kind of a glimpse of, of what, what's to come in the future by how well they were able to, to, you know, close things out. And a lot of this is not only Mike Riley and his staff, but it's the support staff guys behind Mike Riley. The behind-the-scenes guys were very active in helping this out, weren't they, Sean? Yeah, and, and that, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about the old guys in those roles, but I think it's just a different approach. Um, you've got two guys, Ryan Gunderson and uh, Andy Vaughn, both paid six figures to, to, to do their job and manage a big-time operation. Then there's DVD, uh, Mike Riley's right-hand guy right above them. So they really have a, a bigger support staff. And then below those guys, they have a whole army of other people in different roles, and they utilize everybody. You can just tell uh, they have the resources, they know how to use them, and um, they've been able to get it all done the right way. And uh, I think that organization and that manpower is, is going to pay off big here down the stretch for Nebraska. Is this something, Nate, that a lot of schools are implementing now that the rules have changed a couple of years ago that you could add to and expand your staff of, of so-called personnel people? Absolutely. You know, uh, I think there's a, a ton of the, the major players in college football, you know, their support staffs uh, have grown exponentially over the last few years. Uh, but the thing I really like about uh, what Nebraska is doing, not only expanding their staff, but they're kind of thinking outside of the box uh, in terms of, you know, uh, having different ideas of how to approach uh, recruiting and how to get people involved and, and get kids kids, you know, interested in Nebraska with the social media aspect and everything. So, um, you know, and that's something that we're going to continue to see.
Uh, Sky's very excited that we showed the picture of the Teletubbies on the Big Red Wrap Up, and, and she gives us all a big hug. So thank you, Sky. We'll, we'll take all the hugs we can get. Jim says, how concerning, and we're reading your tweets and getting your questions in too, how concerning is there that there's no quarterback in this class given some of the questions there? Do they have room for a junior college transfer, or is that something they're not worried about right now? You know, they're just not worried about it. They flirted with Joe Burrow a little bit. Uh, Mike Riley had conversations with him. I know they were going to go out and see him, uh, but the, the ship had already sailed. Joe Burrow was loyal to Ohio State. He would have committed to Nebraska last March, April, May, uh, but Nebraska didn't offer him then. Ohio State did, and he stuck with that Ohio State commit. But, you know, if they couldn't get a quality guy like that, uh, there was no need to bring in a new quarterback because you already have everybody returning. They did not lose one quarterback on the roster. Everybody was a freshman or a sophomore last year. So what they're going to do now is they're going to really identify a big time 2016 guy and build the class for next year around that guy. Nate, Joe Burrow was one of the names that was the most talked about, certainly in recruiting land since Mike Riley took over because he seemed to be the quarterback that they thought they had a shot to flip with the legacy that he was at Nebraska. Why didn't the previous staff like him as a fit for what they wanted to do? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's two time uh, Mr. Ohio, you know, football, um, you know, all state guy has, uh, uh, you know, thrown for, you know, tons of yards, uh, very little interceptions uh, really is the total package. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, you know, Tim Beck, when when they were recruiting him or evaluating him, uh, he just they weren't interested and they came in on a visit. Um, and uh, really didn't give them, you know, the the time uh, that I think the the Bro family thought that they deserved, and uh, and I think that kind of set the tone going forward, and and uh, they went a different direction. Joe Burrow, and now irony of ironies, Tim Beck is coaching a guy that he didn't and particularly want here. That was the first in-home visit Urban Meyer made. The national championship game was on Monday night, Thursday night on that January 15th or whatever it was, that was the living room that Beck and uh, Urban Meyer went into the first one. So they they locked that up because I think the window was there for Nebraska to get in, um, depending on how it went with Tim Beck in the living room with Joe Burrow, and they were able to solidify it out there. Before we go to break, let's get a glimpse of your top threes in this class. We're going to get into these commits, and we're going to discuss all these guys and talk to some of them coming up here on Big Red Wrap-Up. But, Nate, let me start with you. Your top, the, the, the three that you think are – I don't want to say they're the biggest three of the class, but maybe the three that you think are the, were the most important for Mike Riley. Yeah, three key players to me uh, were Carlos Davis, uh, you know, a, a key defensive tackle uh, who's, who I think is going to be an impact player. Uh, Eric Lee, uh, a shutdown corner who's come in as an early enrollee. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a key commit that, that Mike Riley wrapped up uh, was uh, tight end Matt Snyder, who, uh, who really fits in extremely well with, uh, with Mike Riley's offense and is the maybe be the the most all-around complete tight end that that Nebraska's landed since uh, perhaps Ethan Carter and Matt Snyder is going to join us coming up here on Big Red wrap up Sean what about your three well for me it's it's Carlos and Khalil Davis to start things out um, I, I almost look at them as 1a 1b uh, they're just such a premium defensive tackles and to get two of them um, and they essentially play like a Malik Collins style player uh, then I'm gonna say Avery Anderson Eric Lee out of Colorado they're gonna be here for spring ball uh, I think having them here uh, these are Charlton Warren's guys he, he's been with them he knows them um, I think they're gonna have a great chance to play I will throw Dedrick Young in there too we met, didn't mention him him, uh, but with the linebacker hole at Nebraska, Dedrick Young is going to play as a freshman, uh, barring injuries next year. All right, and I, I was asked to put a three together. What do I know? But I, I threw a three up there anyway. So Eric Lee for me. And I, and I went with positions that I think are big needs for Nebraska. Eric Lee, Dedrick Young, and I, the Davis twins to me were big for a couple of reasons. One, they're big guys in a defensive line. You can't ever have enough big defensive linemen who are talented. But the mindset of this recruiting cycle changed when they locked up those two. When, and I know Lee was big and getting the Colorado, but it was big. But to get the Davis twins locked in really seemed to kind of make everybody exhale who was really paying attention to the, to the first moves of this staff by securing those two as recommits. I think everybody kind of relaxed a little bit about what was going on with this coaching change. Now that could all change if they lose games in the fall. But right now, that seems so big to get those two guys in there to just make everybody go, oh, it's going to be okay. They, they, they secured these two guys. Well, and again. you win championships on the defensive line. And when you can get two premium players 
that have you know world class gifts. I mean, you talk about number one and number four in the discus right now in the nation. Um, these are guys that just don't come along within you know the 500 mile radius very often. And you know, from Kansas City, they grew up Husker fans. They had family members that played at Nebraska. Uh, they had to keep these guys. And you're, you're right. I mean, to keep them in this class uh, was what kind of brought it to where it is. Well, up next on the wrap up, we'll break down the new additions to the offensive side of the ball with Sean and Nate. But first, let's look back at the season that was courtesy of Aaron Babcock from Hale Varsity. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. I'm Kevin Kugler. Be sure to vote in our new sideline survey. What do you think of Mike Riley's first recruiting class at Nebraska? Just go to our Facebook or Wrap-Up website and cast your vote in our very unscientific sideline survey. We are going to dive right in to these commits to the University of Nebraska. We're going to start on the offensive side of the ball. And one of the guys that certainly got a lot of discussion because if you were doing a list of immediate playing time opportunities, I would think the tight end position in Mike Riley's offense would be one that would have some opportunities for somebody who's prepared to come in and make an immediate impact. That's what Matt Snyder hopes to do, and Matt joins us now on Big Red Wrap-Up. Matt, good evening. Welcome to Big Red Wrap-Up. Uh, thank you. How are you guys doing? We are doing great. We really appreciate you taking a few minutes for us tonight. Congratulations on the commitment to Nebraska. You provided Husker recruiting fans with a little bit of angst and a little bit of worry over the last week or so. How serious was the Michigan concern? Should Nebraska fans have been too concerned about Michigan's interest in you? Um, you know, they shouldn't have been too concerned, but, you know, I definitely was a little interested when Coach Harbaugh called, especially uh, with him, you know, coaching at Stanford and the 49ers, which is uh, pretty close to where I live. So, uh, I mean, we took it. I felt like I owed it to myself to take the trip out to Michigan, and, you know, I wanted to make sure, you know, my decision with, with, with Nebraska was the right one for me, and uh, it definitely is, and, you know, I'm ready to be a, be a Husker. Hey, Matt, go back to that, that final in-home visit Friday morning with Mike Riley, and I believe your mother told us that you guys had quiche uh, for breakfast yeah. with Coach Riley uh, during that in-home visit. First of all, it must have been some pretty good quiche, uh, but secondly, what, what, did, what did Mike Riley say and at that point, did you know before the visit you were going to stick with Nebraska, or did he have to convince you on Friday morning to stay? 
Well, uh, it, first of all, it was my first time trying quiche. You know, we figured it was pretty special that <laughs> Coach Riley was coming over, so we figured we'd pick some up. And, uh, uh, you know, Mike Riley, did, he came in and, uh, you know, he was over for, it must have been, you know, two and a half hours. And him and Coach uh, Langsdorf really just reinforced how much they uh, wanted me to be part of something great in Nebraska and, uh, you know, how they were going to use a tight end position and how, how, it was, how they needed it. And they said there's an opportunity for some early play time and uh you know they said really good things and you know we told them about about michigan and they said you know they said they thought it was a good idea for you to go check it out and go explore all your options so you know they were great the whole time and uh me and coach Riley have a good great connection and uh i think we really are gonna you know i feel i'm really gonna enjoy him as my coach now matt you, you just mentioned you have a good connection with coach riley you know, uh, talk about that relationship and, and how far back that spans. Um, well, he started recruiting me almost a year, a year and a half ago up at Oregon State. And then, uh, you know, when he left Oregon State, I was, I was shocked and, you know, a little bit disappointed. I didn't really know what to do. But when he extended the offer uh, to me when he was at Nebraska, you know, I was really excited and happy that he, uh, you know, stuck with me throughout the whole process. And, and uh, you know, it means a lot that, He's been recruiting me since the beginning and stuck with me all the way to the end. And, you know, we really just uh, get along well together and stuff, and I really like him. Matt, I know you've probably already figured this out, but in case you haven't, Nebraska fans, a little bit crazy for college football around here. They're anxious for it to be September already. And you mentioned you talked with Coach Langsdorf and Coach Riley about how they'd utilize you in the offense. Give Husker fans a little glimpse as to what the offense is going to look like starting this fall. Um, yeah, you know, the fans have been great. And uh, Coach Riley is a, you know, he said he will be running the uh, offense with a tight end on the field, you know, most of the time. So, uh, you know, that's obviously a part of, you know, I wouldn't go to a place that wasn't going to use a tight end. <laughs> so they will be using a, a tight end. And, you know, he said, you know, any way we could really create mismatches in the passing game, you know, whether my hand's in the dirt or split out, he said we'll see, you know, depending on matchups and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, the fans can, can expect me to, and other tight ends to be on the field and, and performing. Matt Snyder, Nebraska tight end. Matt, congratulations on the, on the signing, and best of luck the rest of your high school season. We'll see you coming up here in the fall. All right, good deal. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Matt. Matt Snyder, Nebraska tight end. And it is a guy in a spot that has immediate playing time opportunities, especially in this new offense. Well, just two scholarship tight ends return on the team right now. Seathan Carter, we know, is going to play. And then, obviously, Sam Cotton. Uh, but then you've got a lot of walk-on guys there in, in contention uh, that played the last couple seasons. So, really, the opportunity for Matt Snyder is as good as any position on the offense with just two scholarship players currently ahead of on the depth chart. Let's stay on the offensive side, Nate, and let's talk about Nebraska's running back commit in this class. And this is a guy that kind of came out of left field, was an old conference foe that had him initially. Yeah, Divino Zigbo uh, had originally committed to, to Iowa State. Uh, you know, when Nebraska lost Kendall Bussey, um, you know, Charlton Warren kind of pulled out uh, Divino Zigbo's name. He, he's a guy that, that Warren had known about, uh, and, uh, and he showed him to, uh, to Coach Riley, and, and they immediately thought that he would fit in very well with the offense. He, he's, a, he's a big, powerful back, uh, can run inside, outside, but uh, the thing that most excited him about him uh, was his hands. And he's got tremendous hands, can catch the ball extremely well out of the backfield, uh, and he's got good speed for, for being you know, 5'11", 225 pound back, uh, plays, uh, you know, Texas 6A football, uh, very good competition. And, and he's coming into Nebraska, um, you know, preparing to, to see early playing time. Caught 22 passes for 415 yards in his senior season in an offense that relied more on the pass game than the run game. Still had about 800 yards rushing in his senior season, but over 700 receiving yards in his last two years of high school football. Is that a glimpse as to what we're going to see a little bit from this offense in the fall as well, Sean? Yeah, they, they want that versatility, and who doesn't? But I think even more so than ever, we didn't see Nebraska throw to the running backs a ton in Tim Beck's system. Now, previously under Watson and Callahan, that was something you saw more of. Uh, but I think you're going to see the running back get the ball thrown to him more. You're going to maybe see fullbacks that get the ball thrown to him at times. And uh, I think that's uh, something to watch here 
um, with him and what they do. I love the size, though. You just don't see a lot of 225-pound running backs out there. A lot of guys now are the 5'9", 5'8", 180-pound kind of speed backs, and he's fast, but he also has a lot of physicality to him. Well, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see. Is there an opportunity for early playing time for Devine? I think there is because uh, of his pass catching abilities. You know, uh, I think that he's a guy who could come in and, and kind of find a niche in the in the offense. You know, maybe not be you know the every down back right away, but he's a guy who could come in and find a niche in the offense. And and they told him they said we want you to prepare like you're going to play this fall. All right, let's talk wide receivers. Obviously, an area that Nebraska has some players to replace. Kenny Bell gone, so you go out find a couple of guys. Levon Alston's a guy who committed just a few days before signing day. And this was a real win. I mean, I thought down the stretch, Levon Alston was probably one of the bigger guys they got. He played in the Semper Fi All-American All-Star game. Very highly regarded player in California. Uh, picked Nebraska over Washington State, Arizona State, uh, Oregon State. He had a number of West Coast teams on him, and uh, they got him here, and the key, Kevin, was the family. Both mom and dad were with him in Lincoln, um, and you can just tell. Nate and I spoke with him Sunday night. Um, he was just like, wow. I mean, I think more than anything, he was blown away by just how big time football is here. I don't think guys quite understand that. Then when they get here, they're like, it's a different level uh, when they get to experience the program and see it all up close. All right, the other wide receiver is one that was committed for a long time in this class, Nate, and that's Stanley Morgan, one of the guys that Mike Riley made a point to go visit in that first week as head coach. Yeah, Stanley Morgan, you know, committed to the previous staff, uh, comes out of New Orleans, so, you know, an area where Nebraska's had a lot of success lately. Uh, and comes from a high school that is, is one of the best uh, programs in the, in the entire state. Uh, and he's had an extremely productive, you know, high school career. Uh, and maybe, you know, some of the best hands uh, that, that you see, you know, across the entire country. So, uh, you know, he's a four-star wide receiver. Um, he's only six foot tall, but he plays like he's six foot three by the way that he's able to high point the ball and his catch radius is just ridiculous it you know he, he can catch the ball on traffic and uh, um, you know if the ball's up there I mean he's coming down with it terrific hands now you're talking about a guy who had 112 catches in his last two years of high school football and he missed a couple of games in his senior season with a shoulder injury or that number would have been higher and one of the things I always like to do is look at offer lists who offered this guy he had the who's who of college coaches coming to his door. Georgia, Florida, Clemson, Michigan State, Ohio State all lobbed offers his way. But the only visit he made was to Nebraska. He fell in love with this place very early and didn't waver. And it was Kendall Busty that actually kind of helped Nebraska initially get in the door with Stanley Morgan. But unlike Kendall Busty, Stanley Morgan stayed loyal. And there was a moment there where he was kind of flimsy. It was like the five days where Mike Riley hadn't been hired yet. Uh, then I think once Riley got in that living room, it was a Friday night visit, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, they, they spoke with him on a Friday night, and that, that solidified things. But um, he played in the Rivals five-star challenge. Uh, you know, he was highly decorated. I mean, this is – you don't see receivers like this leave the SEC region very often. Before we leave the offense, let's go to the offensive line because Jalen Barnett's a guy that got a lot of folks excited when he became a prospect and then a commit to the University of Nebraska. He had a lot of national guys saying, whoa, Nebraska just went in and got on some boards the top guy out of the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, and what, what was surprising about it is Jalen Barnett was a player that wasn't even on Nebraska's radar before the coaching change. You know, Mike Riley uh, and, and offensive line coach Mike Cavanaugh uh, come to Lincoln, and all of a sudden, you know, they have one of the top overall players in the country. Not just top overall linemen, but top overall players in the country on campus visiting. Uh, and, and we all know the, the tradition of Lawton, Oklahoma program that has produced Will Shields, Mike Minter. Um, and so Jalen Barnett knows, knew all about the Huskers. Uh, he came on campus, uh, fell in love with it, and, uh, and you have to give a lot of credit to, the, to Riley and Kavanaugh because they were the first uh, school to offer him as a sophomore in high school. And you, you've got a staff there at Lawton that likes Nebraska. Uh, Milt Teniper, years ago, went down to Lawton, installed the Nebraska offense for a week, put that in there with those guys, and from that point on, a loyalty uh, was with Lawton in Nebraska. They ran the Nebraska offense. They won state championships there, and some of those coaches are still down there, and uh, this is the first, believe it or not, Kevin, this is the first Oklahoma recruit Nebraska's gotten since 2005. Mm. Craig Rourke was the Craig last Rourke. one. Man, Phil Dillard, Phil Craig Dillard, Rourke. Dillard, Dillard, same class. Yep, that same class. Uh, size 18 shoe. For Jalen Barnett. Massive. He's a big being. boy. Large individual. You want large on the offensive line. Michael Decker's no slouch in the size department. This is a guy who Nebraska 
as a Omaha North product. You're talking about a guy who's been committed for a long time, since April of 2014. And this was the first in-state offer Barney Cotton and the former staff made. Um, and, you know, Michael Decker, you know, when you see him on the street just in clothes, he's not going to, he's not a physical specimen by any means. Kind of reminds me almost of a Spencer Long type. He, he's very professional. I have friends that work at Omaha North, and they said when you talk to him, he's like talking to a, an adult. I mean, he's very mature, very well spoken. Um, but on the football field, this kid turns it on. And, you know, there's a reason. Calvin Strong was a talented running back, but there's a reason why he ran for so many yards because he had some great linemen in front of him. And that Omaha North line was, was one of the best we've seen in Nebraska in the last several years. And that was a nice keep in state for Nebraska, part of that 500 mile radius. Also in the 500 mile radius, just the state south in Kansas, Christian Gaylord, a, a guy who's been committed even longer than Michael Decker committed to the University of Nebraska and own one of those other guys, Nate, that only visited Nebraska despite a nice list of offers. Yeah, and Christian Gaylord, massive offensive tackle prospect and is a key position in this class because Nebraska is losing four offensive tackles after next season. Uh, and and the, the previous staff did a terrific job of recruiting him. They were on him since his sophomore year of high school uh, and they had grown up Nebraska fans, uh, always loved everything about Nebraska, uh, committed to Bo Pelini and, and all, really all they wanted to know is they wanted to make sure that Mike Riley, Mike Cavanaugh wanted Christian Gaylord at Nebraska. And once they, you know, realized that that was the case, uh, they were all in. One more offensive line discussion to have, and it, Charles asks this on Twitter. Doesn't Nebraska already have a long snapper on scholarship and a walk-on? Why a long snapper? Why Jordan Ober? Well, first of all, they don't have a long snapper on scholarship. Gabe Miller has been medically retired, um, and Gabe just got married this offseason here, um, but he, he had a back injury that took The him. marriage had nothing to do with him no, medically no, no. retiring. No, he, uh, back injury took him out of football forever, and uh, Josh Falkenberry um, will, will you know come in and compete now, but Bruce Reed, um, you know, he's a high-paid special teams coach, really one of the only special teams coordinators in college football, um, wants to make sure he has the type of guy he needs. And he evaluated the long snapping situation during the bowl practices, and he said, we need to make sure we get someone in here that can get the ball at the speed we need. And um, I think Ober is going to have a great chance, obviously, to be the starter, but Falkenberry and him will, will compete for that now in camp. Incidentally, Barney Cotton now working for his former high school head coach, Tony Sanchez, who's the head coach now at UNLV and used to run that Bishop Gorman program, one of the best programs in the nation at a high school level. Yeah, powerhouse program, the number one team in the country this past year. All right, so the offensive side is complete for the discussion here on Big Red Wrap Up. A, a list of offensive linemen, your running back pick, your couple of wide receivers, no quarterback in the class. We talked about that earlier. So put a cap on that offensive side. Up next, we're going to switch to the defensive side. A lot of folks to get through. Still time on the show to do it. Before we go to break, though, let's look back at some of the best photos from the 2014 season, courtesy Aaron Babcock from Hale Varsity. Back in just two minutes.
Welcome back to NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. I'm Kevin Kugler. Be sure to vote in our new sideline survey. What do you think of Mike Riley's first recruiting class at Nebraska? Just go to our Facebook or Wrap-Up website and cast your vote in our very unscientific sideline survey. It's a survey that's going up, up, up. 85% now saying just what he needed to do. We're shifting from offense to defense, and it seems like a perfect place to start is with what Joyce says on Twitter. Can't wait to see the twin terrors tear up the place. Hashtag GBR. Carlos and Khalil Davis joining us here. First up is Carlos. And, and Carlos, it is a pleasure to have you with us as the older of the twins. I guess you get to go first. Yeah, so yes, that's, that's how it goes. Age, bef <laughs> age before beauty, right, Carlos? There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, this, this, I know, was a, a very interesting time for you guys. You commit to a, a, an old staff. That staff leaves. A new staff comes in. What was it about Mike Riley and his coaching staff that sold you and your brother on staying with the Huskers? It was when he came to our high school, you know, met our high school coach. He had nothing to brass on. They thought he was the, the paper uh, copy guy that changed <laughs> to this. And, but he just came to the house, and he, he sat down, got to know us, and he talked to the family, and he was just – he had that high-character uh, home feel like to him. He just wanted to get to know us and, and uh, just talk. Carlos, talk about your history, though, with Nebraska. You guys grew up Nebraska fans in Kansas City. You have some family ties to the program. Kind of just inform Husker fans your history uh, with how you became Nebraska fans and when it started. Okay. Uh, back in eighth grade is when my, my uncle first took us up to Lincoln. We, we were there for about um, two days. And uh, the second day, we got we were like on campus watching the practice. And I remember uh, uh, Roy Hallou walking across the, the walk to the indoor practice and being able to watch him play. And that was eighth grade. And then ninth grade, we went up there for a camp. And we were on a Husqueball team. And we won that the, the, the whole thing, the, the tournament Husqueball thing. And um, there was a, a, a bunch of good players on that team. I don't know if you guys know CJ, CJ Johnson, but he was on that team with us. And... Uh, Tenth grade is when we like started getting recruited, and then Nebraska came, and they were the last ones to offer. And then, but we that was like our dream school growing up, and be able to be going there now. It's it's awesome. Carlos Davis, whose twin brother Khalil is with him. Carlos, I'm going to have you pass the phone over to your brother if you don't mind. We appreciate talking to you. Can we talk to Khalil for a minute? Oh. Hey, Khalil, this is Nate Klaus. Uh, you know, uh, talk about your, your relationship with the other commits in this class and, and what kind of role that had, um, you know, and you guys remaining committed to the Nebraska. It was a, it was, well, it was a big part because uh, me, uh, me, Christian, Carlos, Avery, and Eric were kind of like the people who started or who committed first, and we knew we had to keep it together. If uh, this recruiting class was going to be wanted to grow, and we were able to do that and get more recruits. So. Khalil, when you guys get on campus and start, as uh, as Joyce mentioned on Twitter, tearing things up this fall, what can Nebraska fans expect from you guys when you get on campus? What are they going to see from the Davis twins in Husker uniforms? Uh, they're going to see some uh, bluntless players that uh, love to compete and love to work hard. Now, Khalil, Khalil, in track, you're number one in the nation. In the discus, your brother, I believe, is number four. Uh, are you guys, talk about track, will that be an option? Will you guys take part in track and field here at Nebraska as well? Well, he, he's number one, and I'm number four. Okay, I got it mixed up. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a big part. We've always done track, and it did be hard not to stop. But uh, I just love doing – I love track almost as much as I love football. But uh, I just can't wait to do both. Khalil Davis and Carlos Davis, they are on Twitter. It's D Twin Terrors, and I know a lot of people have already been congratulating you there. We congratulate you for the, uh, for the signing, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thanks for the time tonight. You're welcome. We appreciate it. Khalil Davis and Carlos Davis. Now, 
there's a third Davis in this class, and the third Davis has no relation to the other two. But, Nate, tell us a little bit about Alex Davis, who's kind of an unknown commodity. Yeah, really uh, is, a, is a kid who flew under the radar, um, you know, for a lot of schools because this past season was the first year he had ever played football. He was a, a, a highly regarded uh, basketball player down in, in southern uh, Florida, uh, decided that his future was, was going to be in football. Went out last spring. It was the first, literally the first time he'd ever put a football helmet on. Uh, in, the, in his spring game, he had four sacks, deflected a couple passes, uh, and, and really from there the, the ball got rolling on, on the recruiting uh, side of things. You know, Nebraska entered the picture late with an offer. Uh, were able to talk him into taking a visit. Uh, his parents came up here, and the rest is history. Signed with Nebraska. Is he considered a a reach or a project at this point? And I don't want to say reach in a negative way, but it's a guy who's not had a lot of football experience. I wouldn't call him a reach because the athletic ability and the size are there. You know, 6'5", 220 pounds, uh, very fluid athlete. Uh, but, but he has a long ways to go and just in terms of learning the game and developing. He reminds me a little bit of Kimoko Ture, who is the pass rush specialist that Rutgers had this year. Didn't have a football background a whole lot, but came in and made an immediate impact because he was so athletic. Just an athlete. And those basketball, there's that old saying, defensive ends, tight ends, you like that basketball player mix, and uh, he brings that to the table. All right, one more on the defensive line to talk about. And this was one that Nebraska fans had to sweat a little bit. In-state product, Omaha Central guy. Deshaun Neal got another late run. This was the other one that Nebraska beat Michigan for. And Mark Banker has already dubbed the Twin Terrors and the Twin Towers on the outside with Deshaun Neal and Alex Davis. But, you know, Deshaun is a guy that a year ago at this time, literally exactly a year ago, we saw him at Omaha Central, and he was an unknown commodity. But what Jay Ball told us is we've got a guy that's 6'7", almost 6'8", and there's going to be a lot of people interested in him. Not many people know his name now. And uh, Coach Ball was right. Uh, Michigan, Oregon, Iowa. He took an official visit to Oklahoma. It got pretty interesting. Uh, and everybody was interested in that upside. And even the former defensive line coach here, Rick Kaczynski, was really excited about Deshaun. Uh, he said, this is a guy by year two, year three, you're going to see him develop into a man and, and get more and more physical and stronger in the weight room. All right, Nate, let's shift to linebackers. Another late pickup for Nebraska, but one that was really important, Muhammad Berry. This is, a, this is an exciting prospect. Absolutely. You know, Muhammad Berry might have the, the most exciting, you know, highlight film out of anyone in this class. Uh, extremely athletic linebacker, uh, very fast, and he's violent. You know, he makes plays on the field. Uh, he does a little bit of everything, but uh, uh, more than anything, he, he, he can run, and he's extremely violent. Uh, and this is a guy that knows the Nebraska program because Eric Johnson, former Husker linebacker, has worked with him away from the football field. And he's an off-the-field trainer for him. And, um, you know, I know Charlton Warren and him now have gotten to know each other a little bit down there in Georgia. Um, so that's a relationship for Nebraska that's going to be big because he works with a lot of athletes in that area. And Coach Warren has really proven he can get around the back roads in Georgia and he can find some guys. And um, I think that really impressed Mike Riley uh, with what he brought to the table with his inner knowledge of uh, Georgia and, and some of the places down there. Yeah, not a bad place to go and get talent. There's a lot of it in there that you see a lot of SEC schools raiding the state of Georgia to try to take it away from the University of Georgia, obviously, SEC in the own state. Now, let's stay with linebacker, and let's talk Tyron Ferguson. This is a young man from New Orleans, an Edna Carr product that was an Oregon State commit and came over with this staff. Yeah, Tyron Ferguson, you know, immediately switched his commitment from Oregon State to Nebraska uh, because he absolutely loves Mike Riley. And really, it's the relationship he has with Trent Bray uh, that, that really caused him to, to not even hesitate about committing to Nebraska without ever visiting. Um, you know, and, and as far as a player, you know, he's, uh, again, very fast, athletic guy. Uh, played defensive end for Edna Carr this past year. Uh, had close to 20 sacks, was uh, the district MVP. Uh, you know, and they play at a very high level there, an extremely competitive school, uh, and he is a hungry. He, he wants to become the best, and, and I think that's a trait that Nebraska really likes about Ferguson, uh, and, and he's going to be one of these linebackers, you know, given the depth that's currently on campus, that could come in and, and possibly, you know, earn some pl early playing time. And he's one of three Edna Carr guys now on the roster. I'm sure that played a factor, having guys like Jariah Tolbert um, and some of the, and, uh, and Glenn Irons here uh, to kind of help sway him to make that switch. And it's got to be encouraging for Nebraska fans to see that Louisiana pipeline continue 
with this coaching staff because as Nate mentioned earlier that's been a really important pipeline for Nebraska over the last few years and Keith Williams will I think be the guy that continues that he's he's a younger coach uh, that's good with the players he knows the scene down there because he coached at Tulane so he'll be big for Nebraska down there when this week started Adrian Talon was not a Nebraska Cornhusker he was not anybody as of Monday but as of signing day he became a Nebraska Cornhusker a lot of people don't know much about this kid, Nate. What's, what's his story? Well, Adrian Talon is another kid that was identified very early on by Trent Bray while, while they were at Oregon State. Uh, they actually committed to Oregon State at one point in time. Uh, decommitted, kind of opened things up, uh, gained a number of offers, um, you know, visited TCU, Pittsburgh. You know, Pat Narduzzi was after him extremely hard. Uh, you know, and visited Temple too, which was the first program to, to ever offer him a, a scholarship. So he felt like he owed them at, at least a visit. Uh, and it was kind of made Nebraska sweat, you know, because he's a guy that they really wanted. Another very athletic kid that can run. Uh, again, very violent player. He, he has no regard for his body on the <laughs> football field, uh, you know, but uh, he, he didn't commit until later on in the day and, and kind of had uh, Coach Bray sweating a little bit. Well, he and then Dedrick Young round out this linebacker class. Now, Dedrick Young, the only non-secondary guy of the four early enrollees. He's already on campus. He's already doing his thing. This is a very intriguing prospect. Very intriguing. Uh, you know, I know a few coaches from other schools that recruit the state of Arizona, and, and one of them said to me, he's like, how did Nebraska get this kid out of Arizona? I mean, he, he was an outstanding player as a running back. And, you know, last night at the recruiting dinner, since he's already on campus, they interviewed Dedrick Young on the big screen. And both Nate and I looked at each other and we said, look at his shoulders. I mean, he, he is a big physical kid. And uh, with the lack of linebackers Nebraska has, uh, they had four scholarship linebackers at the end of the season. They moved Luke Gifford to give them five. Dedrick Young is going to be in the two deep literally from the first snap of spring practice and he may even see snaps with the first team defense if he progresses so he is in a great position Kevin of really any of the newcomers to play as a freshman four linebackers in this class had to get linebackers in because that position was woefully thin as Sean mentioned going out of last season let's move to the secondary now because these were some big big catches for Nebraska let's start with Avery Anderson already on campus and already enrolled and one of the more impressive recruits uh, that I've dealt with not just in in this cycle but but since you know since I've been in the recruiting business uh, I mean a very impressive young man very intelligent uh, and driven you know he, he they had specific goals in mind uh, you know when they started the recruiting process they wanted to enroll in school early uh, they did whatever it took to, to graduate early uh, and and they spent you know every weekend driving up to Denver Colorado working out with former NFL all-pro Brian Dawkins uh, to, to kind of refine his game uh, extremely athletic kid comes to campus with a, a great skill set and he's got great size and length too which Charlton Warren really likes he, he likes taller corners uh, that can be physical uh, and that can run well and, and Avery Anderson you know being on campus uh, you know will be able to compete for early playing time he committed in February of 2014 but was the first target as Mike Riley went out in that first week he and of course Eric Lee the two guys from Colorado both are on campus both enrolled early both ready to compete for a job and Sean, a little bit about Eric Lee. I, I know he and Avery Anderson have a great relationship, and now they're ready to try to compete for some room in the two deep. And, and they compete against each other. When uh, we were in Chicago for this Rivals camp here, it was Avery Anderson that took home the MVP award that day of the defensive backs, and Eric Lee was mad. I mean, he was like, I wanted to win that award. And uh, these two guys, they are so driven, they are so focused, they want to get better. Um, and, you know, they were focused and driven to graduate early, get to Nebraska and compete right away. Uh, you know, they, they just, you know, have it all together. And you just don't see kids uh, that have that skill set along with the drive. And that's what I'm going to be excited to see how they blend in now with the new coaching staff. And Brian Dawkins also involved in his coaching as well at his high school. Let's go. We've got about three minutes left. We've got two guys to cover. Let's start with Aaron Williams as we move in that secondary to the safety. Aaron also on campus as the fourth guy to enroll early, Nate. Yeah, and this is a, a kid that Charlton Warren identified very early on in the recruiting process as, uh, you know, a safety that, that could, uh, you know, tackle well, but also, you know, cover. And uh, he, he comes on campus, uh, I, I believe he was here for the spring game, uh, fell in love with Nebraska, you know, took a little while to decide after that, but but once he committed, he, he never wavered because of Charlton Warren. His, his, uh, Aaron and his family absolutely love Charlton Warren. Um, 
and and he's kind of a guy who, who may not get a you know as much run as some of the other players, uh, but but he's very impressive and and I think he's going to you know factor into the mix uh, during his career here. And we keep talking about Coach Warren. He was responsible, Kevin, for eight of the 20 commits wow. in this class. Very impressive, and that holdover factor certainly helped that because he'd been on in on these guys longer and had that relationship with a lot of them. And too. basically, any guy in the South, he had the tie to get them here. Uh, to finish his class out. One more guy to talk about, also from the South, but from Memphis, Tennessee. This is a guy who committed on the final weekend before signing day this year. Had the decommit from Memphis to do so, but diamond in the rough in Antonio Reed, Nate? Yeah, I believe so. You know, uh, as a coach, you know, as signing day nears, you always want to have, you know, kind of the, the ace card up your sleeve just in case anything goes awry. And this is uh, what Antonio Reed was. You know, he was a player that Charlton Warren had identified as a guy he liked. He was committed to Memphis. Uh, they brought him in that very last weekend and uh, he, he got the offer from Nebraska and very versatile player he, he could literally play uh, nickelback uh, safety or grow into a linebacker so uh, uh, it was a guy who's a you know a 14 7 you know 110 high hurdle guy uh, very athletic and, and smart kid Sean we've got about a minute to go in this show having seen all these guys having covered all these guys give me two or three that you think are locks for early playing time? I'd say Dedrick Young, Matt Snyder on offense because of the tight end situation. I think those two I feel really good about. Um, and then on defense, I, I think some of those guys, another, more linebackers. With four linebackers, I think two of them will see playing time next year um, and maybe even some of those secondary guys. It, the door is open. Nate, you're, who do you see as an early playing time candidate? You know, Muhammad Barry is a guy along with Dedrick Young, you know, on, on defense. Um, and, then, and, of course, I don't think you could discount any of the early enrollees. I, they're coming in. The, the slate is clean, and there's going to be plenty of competition this spring. Uh, so they could play early on the offensive side, you know, any of the skill position guys uh, and then uh, Matt Snyder is going to be a, a very important player in the offense uh, tweet asking us how will the walk on program change or evolve there's eight walk on so Matt, far it's that we nine, nine. Uh, there was one that they didn't have on there but uh, it's a good list I mean it's 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 quality it's not necessarily quantity I mean usually we'd see about 15 or even 20 now that's going to keep growing they're working on that uh, I, I talked to Kenny Wilhite and some of the guys last night at the recruiting dinner and it, it's a, a evolving process to keep filling that number uh, but I think they'll get it around 15 or 12 here uh, before it's all said and done the son of Trent Green still in the mix he is still in the mix, uh, going to be deciding in a couple weeks uh, between Stanford, Northwestern, and Nebraska. All right, our thanks to Matt Snyder and our thanks to Carlos and Khalil Davis for joining us tonight. And also, as always, thanks to you for tuning in and spending some time with us this evening. For Sean Callahan and Nate Klaus, I'm Kevin Kugler. Good night, everybody. Video on demand presentation of Big Red Wrap Up is made possible by the following sponsors. Big Red Wrap Up thanks these sponsors.